Thanks for coming, everyone. So we have uh, Dr. Wayne Lucek as our guest speaker this evening. Uh, Dr. Lucek is a professor of labor studies and economics at our very own McMaster University. He studied U, uh, U of T in economics for his undergraduate and graduate studies and received his PhD in economics from Cambridge University. His early research focused on the history of technology in the auto industry, but more recently his research has examined how changes in employment organization impacts quality of life at work and health outcomes. Right now, Dr. Luchuk is also serving as co-director of a five-year joint university community research program on poverty and employment precarity in Southern Ontario, um, which is called PEPSO, which you might have seen on our event site. In this capacity, he oversees the collaborative work of over 20 community organizations, including United Way Toronto and researchers from several universities. He's here this evening to discuss with us his latest research um, and the report from PEPSO on employment precarity and household well-being. And I'll hand it over to Dr. Lucek. Thanks, Aaron. Um, and, and thank you, everyone here, for uh, coming out on this uh, glorious June uh, day in the rain and the cold. Um, uh, let me start by saying a little bit about how, how I got to here and, and who, uh, who the PEPSO uh, group is. So uh, I, got, I got to here by initially studying uh, workers uh, and work reorganization in the auto industry. And so my real interest, in early interest was on people in full-time, permanent jobs with benefits, unionized, um, the, real, the real deal in terms of what was, used to be called the standard employment relationship. So think of this as sort of the Ford, the Ford GM kind of jobs. And in Hamilton, you could think about this in the past in terms of Stelco jobs. Of course, those have all just about disappeared now. Um, and, and I was pretty interested in, in, in health uh, of these workers. And I, had a, I got a, you know, a nice big grant to start uh, measuring blood pressure and work organization. And uh, wow, we, we, we had real trouble finding anything. I mean, part because blood pressure is a, is a difficult thing to work with. But I think more to the point, what we came to understand is that uh, as, as dismal as working on the assembly line was, you know, you're on a 22 second job cycle, there's all kinds of, uh, of antagonism and conflict in those kind of workplaces, uh, exposure to bad air uh, and, and fatigue, et cetera. Uh, there are also a whole lot of upsides. And the upsides were that you had a really good benefit package, so your, your, your family was taken care of, uh, you had a tremendous amount of security, so sort of in, 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 in December uh, of a year they would publish a shift schedule, uh, and that told you for the next 12 months what, sh what shifts you're going to be working on. Um, you had bidding rights, so you could, you could bid on a job as you got more seniority, and so you knew what your work would be, you knew who your co-workers were, uh, you more or less knew who your, your direct managers were. If you had one you didn't like, you bit out into another area. So you had a surprising amount of, of control. And I think what we came to understand, those, those, are, those are actually really good things for your health. Uh, having that kind of control at work and having that kind of security and, and confidence that your family is being taken care of is, 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 is relatively healthy. And just at the time we sort of, I, I was getting that work done, uh, it, it became quite uh, well recognized in the literature that there'd been a fundamental change in the labor market, that we were moving away from those kind of jobs that were permanent, full-time, with benefits, uh, well-paying, unionized, and we were moving into a new kind of labor market where increasingly work was insecure, it was contract work, it was through temp agencies, um, it, it often didn't have benefits, often it was self-employment, so we, we saw an explosion of self-employment in, in the 1990s and 2010 period. Now it's over 10% of all employment is self-employment. And, and those jobs didn't have these features of, of security, of permanence, of benefits, knowing who you're working with. Um, and I began thinking, what were the health implications of that kind of, of, that kind of work? And that resulted in a, in a book that I published in, in 2011, a little bit of a, a selfish uh, self-promotion, called Working Without Commitments, The Health Effects of Precarious Employment, uh, published by McGill Queens University Press. And what it showed very clearly is those people in those kinds of insecure jobs, they had more sleep problems, they were having more headaches, they reported poor health, poor mental health, more fatigue than people who were in those kind of four G uh, GM jobs. But the other thing that became obvious in doing that research was we had a lot of trouble scheduling interviews with people in precarious employment, in these, in these insecure jobs. And 
it wasn't so much that they didn't want to be interviewed. It's more they said to me, look, Wayne, I, 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 can't, I can't commit to a, an interview Wednesday morning because I don't know if the temp agency is going to call me Tuesday and, get, and, and ask me to come into work. And if I, have, if I get that call, I have to go into work. I can't commit, uh, I can't commit to you. And that got me thinking, well, you know, what, if, what if their kids wanted them to coach the ball team? Right? In the ball team, you've got to coach every Tuesday and Thursday night. Well, you can't make that commitment because you don't know when you're going to be working. And you know, what if you wanted to sort of arrange uh, a daycare, right, and, or child care? And most child care is you know, Monday to Friday from 7 o'clock till, till 6 o'clock or whenever uh, the child care center closes. But I don't know what my work schedule is. Sometimes, you know, if I, if I get a job in a casino, I'm going to be working weekends. Um, you know, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm a teacher, uh, well, guess what? They call me up at 7 o'clock in the morning and say, be there at 8 o'clock because a teacher uh, doesn't show up. So how do I arrange child care in that kind of a, of a situation? And that led me to start thinking about what are the broader effects of precarious employment beyond the individual's health? What does this mean for our families? What does this mean for our communities? And that's really how I got, I got to this place. And that's half the story. The other half of the story is how did my partners get to this place? Because this is very much a, a collective project. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of the lead academic on it and there are other academics involved. Uh, but the, 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 the co-principal investigator of this is the United Way of Toronto. And so how did the United Way of Toronto get to this, this, this space and want to do this study? And that came through some of their research. Uh, they issued a report called Losing Ground, uh, where they basically identified that the parts of Toronto that are under social duress also tend to be the parts of Toronto where people were saying, all we have is this kind of temporary short-term employment. We can't get onto a career. We can't get any permanency. Uh, and that's affecting uh, my, my family. It's affecting how I participate in my, in my community. And so by serendipity, the two of us came together about, about five years ago and thought through how are we going to, how are we going to get a handle on this? Because we sort of anecdotally know what's going on, but we don't have any really hard evidence. And so we, we applied for a, a large grant, it's called, it was called a CURE grant, Community University Research Alliance. It's a SHRC funding federal government meant to bring together community partners and, and, and university researchers on common grounds. And they, they, uh, they foolishly gave us the money uh, three years ago. And that allowed us to, to get going uh, on this project. So the real focus here of, of this group um, is to try and understand what does the changing nature of the labor market mean for the kinds of households we have and the kind of community we have. And in part, this is driven by my own training. I'm actually an economic historian. I, I like to, rather than really an economist, I'm an economic historian. And, and the economic history literature is very clear that changes over the last 200 years now, um, as we moved first to an industrial society, and then as we moved to, uh, into the 20th century, into, into more of, a, uh, of a, uh, a mass production society, fundamentally changed the kind of family structures we had. And so we went from households where men and women collectively, they worked at home and you know, maybe it was a small farm or they did some weaving in the home and, and sold some cloth in the 1830s and the 1840s. We went to a, 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 an economy where men were allocated waged work and for the most part women were allocated unpaid work at home. And as we moved into the 20th century, that developed more fully into what we call the standard employment relationship. And that's a, a model in which we have a male breadwinner. So the male is the one who brings in uh, most uh, of, of, the, of the resources for the household. And again, the woman is, is, is left at home to uh, wash the dishes and take care of the kids and doesn't get paid for that. Uh, and as we move through the rest of the 20th century, increasingly getting access to a pension was kind of family-based. So a woman had to link up with a man who had a job at Ford because that's how they got the pension. Uh, so the women themselves uh, were in, in employment, which rarely provided that, those kind of benefits. And so we had a very gendered labor market in which men got the well-paying, secure, more permanent jobs um, uh, that were being, uh, that had benefits, uh, dental benefits, healthcare benefits, pension, uh, and, and women were either working on, a, on a more of the fringe of the labor market in part-time, precarious contract work, uh, often low paid without those benefits. And I'll be frank, that was a kind of, I grew up in Windsor, and that was very much the story of, uh, of my family. My dad uh, worked for a, a, a trucking company, was a mechanic, was unionized, 
fairly well paid, uh, at the time had some benefits. Uh, Mum was, uh, was a cashier at a uh, at, at Dominion store before uh, Conrad Black stole her a little bit of pension. Um, but that's another story. But it, very clear, there's no way that my mum uh, could have sustained a, a permanent life on, 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 on the benefits she had. She needed to be in a, in a family relationship. What we've seen is that since the 1970s, and I'm sure people around this table now are experiencing this in spades, is that that simple model, the man going out and getting a permanent, well-paying, full-time job with benefits, the woman either working part-time, temporarily, uh, being responsible mainly for unpaid work at home, has kind of disintegrated. Uh, and it's disintegrated uh, for two reasons. One is those kind of privileged jobs that men were getting have sort of disappeared uh, over the last 30 uh, or 40 years. So for instance, when I started at Hamilton in, 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 at Mac, uh, I guess it's now 32 or 33 years ago, um, there were 13,000 men working at Stelco. Right now there's 600. I, I, I'll start moving them, no, no, don't, don't panic yet. Um, I'll start moving them. So there were, there's only 600 of them now. DeFasco is not all that different. It still produces lots of steel, but employs a, a lot fewer uh, workers. If you went back into the 1970s, the average man in Hamilton earned three times what the average woman in Hamilton earned. Today, it might surprise people to know there's almost no difference. The average man in Hamilton makes about the same as the average woman in Hamilton. And that's just a reflection of the, of the fundamental change uh, in what's going on. And so what we're trying to understand is, what does this mean for our families? What does this mean for our communities? What does it mean for their well-being? And, and that's the project that we took on. So I, uh, the, the project itself, and I'll talk a little bit about where we got our data, but I think this is very typical. One of the people we interviewed uh, telling us, you know, before I knew I had a job, I went and I did it. I came home and I had a life. It's like this precarious work changes you as a person. And I think it's a pretty fundamental idea to think about your, your employment relationship. It, it, it doesn't just change the income you get, it, it changes you as your person, as, as your values, as, as the kind of society we live in. And that's, that's, I think that's a very deep, and, and I, I think it's, it's, it's a very troubling set of questions to ask. So what did we do? So I said, we f I formed this partnership with the United Way of Toronto. Uh, we brought together another a dozen social agencies. Uh, I brought together some of my, my academic colleagues from other universities and from MAC. Um, and uh, we started doing some research. And what I'm going to report on today is one part of that bigger project, which is a, a survey uh, which uh, resulted in uh, a report that we released back uh, in February uh, called uh, It's More Than Poverty. And, and as I go through, you'll understand exactly why we're saying it's more than poverty is the issue here. So the, the research, the data comes from, uh, we did a, a survey of 4,000 individuals. Leger Marketing did that for us. They phoned you know, people up and uh, 4,000 people, to my surprise, actually agreed to spend about 20 minutes on the phone answering our questions. Um, this was a, a random population survey, so basically it was, it was uh, 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 random uh, 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 digital dialing, so the computer just randomly picks a phone number, uh, calls them, and either person either says yes or no to our survey. Uh, and we also, though, interviewed specifically 83 people who we knew were in precarious employment uh, to try and get a more detailed picture uh, of what was, uh, what was going on. So the first question that we had to address is, how do you me measure precarious employment, this new form of employment which is insecure, doesn't have the same kind of security as the old Ford and, and, and General Motors jobs. And you know, poverty is, is relatively easy to measure. You go out and ask a household, how much money do you have? And you can have a debate about at which point poverty sets in. But you know, once you've got a line, either someone is above or below that line. So poverty can sort of be, uh, can, can be, can be measured fairly easily. Insecurity is a lot more difficult. How do you measure how insecure a person is in their employment? And there are two ways to go about that. One is you can use what's called the form of the employment relationship. So you can ask someone, do you work mainly through a temp agency? Are you on a six month contract? Uh, are you uh, own account self-employed? So you're self-employed, you're self but you don't have any employees, right? And normally these are seen as pretty clear indicators that you're not in a kind of Ford General Motors job because those jobs tend to be permanent, ongoing, um, and, and with benefits. So that's, that's one way you can go about it. The problem is that some people in those forms of employment, they can also be quite secure. 
Right? They're not necessarily insecure. So you can work through a temp agency and be perfectly secure, be well paid. You know, maybe you're a contractor, etc. Uh, and you know, you can have tons of work. You know, there are some lawyers out there who are, uh, you know, sell their wares. They don't have any employees, but you know, there's probably lots of work for them to to, to do. So you can be quite secure being uh, self-employed or work through a temp agency or be on contract work. Uh, on the other hand, you can be in quotes a permanent full-time job and feel incredibly insecure. Say, I, look, I don't know if my company is going to survive six months. Right now, if you're working for RIM, you might have a permanent full-time job, but, but you might be looking around the corner and saying, holy cow, you know, is Apple going to eat my lunch? Uh, so the form of the employment is not necessarily a, a, a perfect indicator of insecurity. And so the alternative was, for us, we built what's called an employment precarity index, right, which, is a, which is a direct measure of... Of, of the level of insecurity in different kinds of employment relationships. And let me just spend a moment how we built that, because then you'll know how we pulled the rabbit out of the hat. So we took 10 questions from our survey. Right? So we've got the survey, it's about 80 questions. We took 10 of them, which we thought were indicative of indicators of insecurity. Right? And the 10 questions are, are listed there. So things like, uh, am I paid if I miss work? Right, in most jobs, so I'm, you know, if I get sick, I get, I get paid if I miss work. Uh, but increasingly, people are not paid. If you don't show up, guess what? No paycheck. Um, are they in a standard employment relationship? So that's a job that's permanent, full-time, one employer, that pays you more than just a wage. So there's some kind of a benefit, a little bit of health care benefits, a little bit of a pension. Right, and these, so think of this as a, as a Ford GM kind of job. Uh, does your income go up and down from week to week? Do your hours go up and down from week to week? Uh, are you an on-call worker? So if, let's say you are a fill-in teacher, right? You're, you're, a, you're an on-call worker. You can get called up 7 o'clock in the morning uh, to, go, to be at work at 8, but you never know if you're going to get that call. You may get it, you may not. Um, uh, do you know your schedule in advance? So do you actually know when you're going to be working? Uh, are you going to be working weekends? Are you going to be working during, during the week? Are you paid in cash? You'd be surprised how many people are paid in cash, and that just opens up all kinds of possibilities for abuse, uh, informality. Somehow that's a measure of an informal arrangement. If you're in a formal job, you're almost either being paid by check uh, or you're being paid directly to your bank account. So certainly my employer doesn't come along and say, here, Wayne, here's a, here's a pile of hundreds for this month's work. Um, and the, you know, the money goes directly into the bank, uh, et cetera. Um, do, do you see your job as temporary? Do you actually see yourself as in temporary employment? Do you get any benefits beyond a wage? And again, if, if all you're getting is a wage, then probably this is not a job that's lasting forever. Your employer is sending you a signal. I don't expect you to be here to retirement. I don't, I, and, and if you get sick, guess what? You're out of here. Uh, that's too bad. Um, do you ha can you voice your concerns at work? So again, if you say if you're at a unionized workplace, or myself, it's not unionized, but I have an association. When we thought we had asbestos in, in the ceiling, we put up our hand up and say, guys, there's asbestos up there. Let's figure this out. I didn't think for a moment that I'd lose my job. But if I was a temp agency worker, I might keep my mouth shut. Because as a temp agency worker, I'm hoping that employer will call me up again to get another job. Uh, and so I may, I may not say anything. I just may put up with it because I need the job more than I need my health at the present moment. So this might be another uh, measure of insecurity. So those are the 10 questions that we asked. Basically, each question was worth 10 points. We added them up. And your higher your score on this, the more precarious you were, uh, is how we did it. What's quite important is income is not part of this. So we're not, we don't include poverty. Income is not one of our, our components of, of precarity. And this has allowed us to disentangle the effects of being poor from the, the effects of being precarious. And I, I think this is where some of our most interesting results uh, can be found. Okay, so what, what might this look like? Well, let's suppose you're a temp agency worker. Well, you're probably checking off most of those things, right? You don't know your schedule. You don't know your week's hours vary. You're in temporary work. You don't put up your hand. You score maybe 80 out of 100 on our scale. So you're in precarious employment. And you know, maybe you're making $30,000 a year. That may be optimistic for a temp agency worker. But you know, you're, you're, not making, you're not making 70 or 80,000 most likely. So you're precarious and low income. But let's suppose you're a child care worker, right? So a childcare worker, you're probably not checking very many of those things off. You could be in a, in a fairly permanent relationship, like you have a job with a childcare agency. They might provide a little bit of benefits, probably not a lot of pay, but they have some benefits. Your schedule is pretty regular. You know, be there at seven o'clock. You work for 40 hours a week or 35 hours a week, etc. Uh, 
Uh, you know, your employment is not temporary. It's probably fairly permanent. But you can also be low paid. You can also only be making about $30,000 a year because these are notoriously low paid jobs. So this is someone who can be secure but low income. So the first person is insecure and low income. This person is secure and low income. And so we can, we can disentangle that way. You can do the same thing for university contract workers. Right? The university is now full of contract workers. There may be people around the table who uh, have, have these kind of contract jobs at the university, doing research, uh, being contract teachers. Right? Well, this person, um, they may be uh, relatively insecure, relatively precarious. Right? So they, 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 they're not in a standard employment relationship. They may be on a one-year contract, a two-year contract. If you're lucky, the grant lasts for three years. You're on a three-year contract. When the grant ends, guess what? You're out of work. Um, the university doesn't have any commitment to you. Um, your hours of work may not be stable. Some weeks you may be working a lot of hours, other weeks uh, uh, not so much. You are in temporary employment. You, you may or may not have benefits. But you could be very well paid. Right? So the, the rate of pay for our contract workers is, is, is probably you know, $50,000, $60,000, $70,000 a year. So they're, they're not in the same low income group, but they are precarious. So they're precarious in middle income. Or the last one, maybe this is the aspiration of more people around the table, to be a consultant. Right? and be making $100,000 a year. But you can also probably be ticking off most of those things. As a consultant, miss work, guess what? You don't get paid. Uh, some weeks you work 80 hours a week, other weeks you don't have any work. Uh, so your income goes up and down from month, uh, month to month. You, you probably don't have any benefits that are on your own tab. Uh, uh, you, well, you're probably not paid in cash. You probably don't know your schedule, et cetera. So again, you can be precarious in high income. And we use these two categories, we play them off against each other to get an understanding, what does it mean to be poor and insecure for your family? What does it mean to be middle income and insecure for, uh, on your family? What does it mean to be upper income and insecure or insecure uh, for your family? And as you'll see in a moment, uh, the results are really quite surprising. Okay, is that, that, that's sort of, that's the methods part uh, to, show, to tell you now, it's just the findings, uh, the, the exciting part. Any, any questions before I sort of push on here? Okay, so what did we find? Okay, this is the first chart which uses the form of the employment relationship to get a sense of how are people being employed in the Hamilton GTA area. And again, this is only for people 25 to 65. So retirees are not part of this. Young students coming out of the, out of the university are not part of this. This is sort of core earning uh, periods, 25 to 65. And this is what, when we started uh, shopping this around to the media and to the, pol uh, to the political people, this is what caught their eye. Only half of the people we surveyed were able to tell us, I'm in a full-time, that's 30 or more hours of work a week, a job that I expect to have a year from now, so it has a degree of permanency, um, with one employer, so I'm not piecing together 10 hours here, 15 hours there, 5 hours there, um, uh, that, that pays me more than just a wage, so it has some benefits, not all benefits, but maybe it has dental care, maybe it has health care, maybe it has a pension. Only half of our sample could tell us that. The other half were in something else. Right? About 10%, 8.8, were in permanent part-time jobs. So these are jobs that look, it's part-time, yeah, maybe it doesn't, probably doesn't have benefits, but I expect to have this in a year. And in some ways, this is, this is an ongoing relationship, and I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with that. The other 40%, had some kind of insecurity built into their employment relationship. Uh, about half, uh, that's the, uh, uh, just under half, uh, fifth, the 18.4% there. These are people who are clearly in a precarious form of employment. These are workers in temp agencies, they're on short-term contracts, uh, they are self-employed without uh, employees. So this is uh, contractors, folks like that. They're, 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 they're clearly in a precarious form of the employment relationship. The, the, the maroon, the mac colored uh, pie chart, 22.5, these are people who are in a gray zone. This is really, if we'd been smart, we would have made this the gray slice rather than the, the maroon slice. But these are people who don't say, they're, they're, they don't tell us that they're in working through a temp agency or on a short term contract. They may tell me, yeah, I'm in a permanent full time job, but guess what? I don't know if I'm going to have that job in a year. Uh, or they may be in a permanent full time job, but they have no other benefits. Uh, that, that, that they can get. And so they're, they're in some kind of a gray area. They're, they're not in the kind of, uh, of good for GM jobs. Uh, they're, they're in something else. But they're not quite all the way down to the short-term contract temp workers. And this has come as a bit of a surprise. And I think this is indicative of the new labor market. Had we done this study 30 or 40 years ago, I guarantee you that gold slice would have been three quarters of the pie. Right? 
and the part-time slice would have been a little bit smaller, but not a whole lot. But would have, what would have been significantly smaller would be the gray and the, and the purple colored slices. That's where the real growth has been in the labor market. I think that's the kind of labor market that, that young people are facing. That they're not really getting access to these kind of jobs. This is uh, all the old folks like us. Um, they're getting stuck in this part of the pie. Uh, I think that has uh, very different implications for how they lead their lives. Okay, so the most of the rest of the talk is, is it uses the precarious employment uh, uh, index, uh, employment precarity index to try and get a handle on what's going on. One of the things that became very clear early on is this kind of precarious employment. This isn't the Kelly girl of the 1970s, right? This isn't the woman filling in for a pregnancy leave or for a temporary job. This has become a norm increasingly in, in different sectors. It's reached into socioeconomic groups that were formerly immune from this kind of employment. So I think the university is a great example. The university is now full of people in precarious employment. Whether they're instructors or researchers, uh, there's tons of them. The media, so if you work at a newspaper or you work for the CBC, 25 years ago, you would have been a full-time permanent worker of the Toronto Star or a permanent full-time worker of the CBC. You're not anymore, you're on a contract. Uh, if you're in high tech, you're probably on uh, either self-employed or on some kind of a contract. You don't really have any, any, kind of, any kind of permanency. And what this has meant is that kind of privileged labor market that we talked about that men had in the, in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s has in many ways deteriorated. And so now men and women are facing the same kind of insecurity. So when we accumulate these, these questions and we ask, is, is there a difference between men and women in terms of uh, precariousness, there aren't very many differences. There's huge differences still in wages. So women are still massively underpaid, um, but they're telling us the same kind of thing about the form of the employment relationship, variation in weekly hours, variation uh, in pay. And, and that, that's, a, that's a, a big change, which we're gonna suggest has some important implications for family. And of course, immigrants, new immigrants have always accessed the labor market through these kinds of, uh, of precarious situations. That continues to be the case. They're overrepresented uh, in, in, in that precarious segment of the market. So one of the questions that we, we looked at, and we had a lot of detail, is what exactly does it mean to be working in these precarious jobs? What exactly does it mean in terms of the conditions I face? And then we can look at what, is it, what do those things mean for family and community? And this is sort of one example, again, of someone we interviewed, this notion that, look, I just, I, I don't know, uh, I don't know where my income is coming from. I don't know if I'm gonna have steady work. Uh, you know, it really makes me stressed, and, uh, stressed out and nervous. Okay, so this is the, the first of the slides that uses our employment precarity index. Uh, and so let me just spend a moment explaining what we have here. In this particular slide, what we've simply taken is the 25% of our sample, so approximately the 1,000 people who scored the highest on our employment precarity index. So that's ser that series of 10 questions. They're in the precarious group. And the secure group are the quarter or the 1,000 people who scored the lowest on our precarity index. So they, I, I would be here, right? So, oops, oops. Yeah, okay. So I would be, in, I'm in the secure group, right? I have a permanent job ongoing, et cetera. Uh, my friends at Ford and General Motors, um, they're, they're in this group here. But the, uh, the temp agency worker, the short-term contract worker, they're down here, this new form of employment. And the first thing is that there, there's, there, are, there are economic costs of being here rather than here. So the, the, the purple line, uh, that is the income of the individual who filled in the survey. And you can see there's a difference. The, person, the individual in precarious employment told us that they have an income of about 40,000. The uh, permanent person who was in secure employment had closer to 80,000. So there's almost a 50%, 100% wage difference between the two groups. Now what's also interesting is that doesn't get eliminated when you look at family income, so household income. Because the story of the 1970s is one person had the good job at $40,000 a year, the other person had the insecure job at $10,000. You had one of each in each household, and so every household should look the same, whether you're talking to the man or woman filling in the survey. Well, that's not the case here. There continues to be a significant penalty in household income of being in this precarious group. So certainly the household income is a bit larger, just over 60, but the household income of those in the secure group is closer to 100000 
So there's still a big income penalty to be paid if one person in the household uh, has, has this insecure, precarious employment. And we'll talk a little bit more exactly about where that's coming from. Uh, but it's significant. And that's, it's important that the, the household incomes don't even out the way we might have thought they would. The other thing about being in this, in this uh, precarious group is not only is your income lower, but it's varying from week to week or month to month. Right, so this is a question we ask, uh, to the degree of income variability from week to week in the last 12 months. Um, and what you can see is if you're in, whoops, I keep pushing the wrong button there. If you're in this precarious group, uh, over a third of them say, look, my income varies a lot from week to week. Some weeks I'm making 500, some weeks I'm making nothing. If you're in the secure group, nobody in the secure group says my income varies from week to week a lot. Right? They, they, they know more or less what their income is going to be on a regular basis. Um, and only uh, just over a third of those in this precarious group could tell us, yes, that my, my income, it doesn't vary very much. So I know from week to week. It may not be high, but it's the same from week to week. So imagine you've got a mortgage, right, and, and the banks haven't adopted this new system where the, the, the mortgage payment varies from week to week. Guess what? They want the same amount every week uh, of your money, but your income is not the same from week to week. How do you manage that? What kind of stresses does that create? Do you even buy a house if you're in that kind of a situation? And again, keep in mind, we're not talking here about 18, 19, and 20-year-olds. We're talking people who are at least 25 years old. And for most of our sample, uh, it's a representative by age. They're in their 30s and their 40s. So this is, this is not just a young person phenomena. There's something deeper going on here. Um, the other thing is, you know, we asked them about s scheduling uncertainty. Do you know when you're going to be working? <coughs> and again, what you can see is that if you're in that secure quartile, the thousand people in the more secure jobs who are not precarious, for most part, they always know what their schedule is a week or so in advance. So they know when they're going to be working. So you can, you can arrange daycare. You can arrange other kinds of activities. You can coach your kid's ball team. Uh, if you're in this precarious group, uh, only a third say they always know what their uh, work schedule is uh, at least a week in advance. So two-thirds, sometimes they don't know that. And a quarter say they never know. They never know the week before what they're going to, their, their next week's schedule. So again, if you're going to have kids, how do you arrange childcare with that kind of a situation? Um, how do you arrange, say, to, a, to, to participate in your community? To, how do you arrange to attend courses? Because you, you never know if you're going to be working Wednesday night. One person said, how do you arrange sex when you have that kind of insecurity in your relationship? Right? You just never know when things are happening. So how, you know, how do you fix date nights when you don't know uh, what, what, your, what your working relationship is? So again, all these things, you can put them in the hopper and begin saying, well, of course it's got to have impacts on family. Of course it's got to have impacts on community. Uh, and particularly, if that's becoming the new norm, if we're moving away from secure jobs to precarious work, which seems to be the indicator of the academic literature, then we need to be pretty concerned about what this means for households uh, and for uh, families. Okay, so we then took that data and started exploring what, it, what does this mean for the well-being of, of households? What does this mean for, uh, for community? Uh, and I think this is very indicative of what we were hearing when we interviewed people uh, uh, in this situation. Uh, this is, I want to have work and have a good job and pay my debt and be a provider and be able to have children and provide for them. I wouldn't even think of having children right now because this is what they're saying is, uh, look, I just, I, I, I'm insecure. This is, not a, this is not a guy, so this is not a guy story. This is actually a woman. Uh, she's in her 30s, right? And she went on to say at some point, at some point I'm just going to have to you know, hold my nose and pray because you know, I can't have kids, for, you know, eventually I'm going to hit some kind of a barrier, so I'm just going to have to go ahead and do it. But boy, am I, I'm really quite frightened. Um, and, and I think that's the first thing that's hap that, that we're going to see happening. Households, we know they've been shrinking in size, um, and we know people have been delaying having kids, and somehow we've put together this kind of story that that's, because people, that's what people want. I'd suggest to you that a large part of this is because that's what they have to do to cope with this new labor market. Uh, uh, and, and I think that's a, an important finding. This was one of the slides. You notice there's figure, num figure number 41. And you can actually s download the whole report at www.pepso.ca, as I indicated in the first slide. And there are about 60 or, or so uh, slides, uh, figures in that. I'm going to spare you most of them. So this is figure 41. And in some ways, this was our aha moment, that there's something deeper going on than we had imagined. And so again, this is the first attempt to disentangle precarity from poverty. So again, what did we do here? Well, we took our employment precarity index and we divided it in half. The 2,000 in the most insecure jobs to 2,000 in the more secure jobs. Right? So the secure group 
they've got the four General Motors tenure uh, jobs like I have. The insecure groups, they're the temp agency, short-term contract workers, et cetera. So we just divide the sample in two that way. And then we took household income and we split that in three. So we had a low income group, that's household income less than 50,000, a middle income group, 50 to 100,000, and a high income group over 100,000. Right, so we've got six cells now. So again, thinking back to where I put this together, uh, our temp worker making $30,000 is down here. Our childcare worker making insecure making $30,000 is here. Our uh, university contract worker making $60,000 is here. Uh, and our consultant making $100,000 is up here. Right? So we've, we've divided this up in, in that way. And that allows us to look at the different effects of uh, uh, poverty and, uh, and insecurity. So let's start at the bottom. Insecure, low income. This is our, this is our temp worker. Uh, I don't think we find it very surprising that for those workers, a quarter, almost a quarter, said, look, it, my, my, my employment situation it creates anxiety at home. Right? I, I'm anxious. I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay my bills. don't know if I'm going to be able to feed my kids, support my kids. don't know if I'm going to be able to maintain my standard of living. Uh, I don't think we'd find that, that that's the largest number. Um, and only less than 30%, just over 30% said that's never a problem. Right? That, that's never an issue. I've sorted out how to cope with my insecurity and my low income. One surprise, if we move up a couple of bars here, is this is the secure low income. So this is our child care worker. Right? Uh, they are much less likely, only half as likely, to say my employment situation causes anxiety at home. I'm low paid, I'm poor, but you know, I don't expect to be poor uh, ne next year. I don't expect to be out of work next year. I just don't expect to be paid very well. Uh, and so for them, it's, it's less than half, just, just over 10% versus close to 25% say this is often a problem. Uh, and a few more, though not a whole lot more, say it's never a problem. So again, that was a bit of a surprise, that just having some security makes your situation a lot better. Right? The, if we move up two more bars, oops, yeah, okay, here we are, move up two more bars. This is our insecure middle income. So this is my researchers, right? They're on two-year contracts. This is, uh, this is uh, instructors on con one-year contracts at the university. So they are making they have more than $50,000 household income, so I mean that's not a huge amount, particularly in Toronto, but you know, that's certainly not, that's above uh, 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 a minimum living sort of standard, um, but they're also insecure. Well, you can see, and this was our surprise, this purple bar here, they're not as bad as the low income insecure workers, but holy cow, they're actually worse than the low income secure workers. So those households making 40000 but it's secure, and they know they're going to make 40000 next year, uh, et cetera. They're actually worse off than those people who make 60000 70000 but saying, I don't know if I'm going to have that job uh, next year. I think what this is pointing out is to what extent this new labor market is moving up the socioeconomic ladder. It's, not, it's no longer just an issue of impoverished minimum wage workers, uh, immigrant workers, people of color, women in, in, in temporary works. This has now become more generic throughout our, our, our economy. This is capturing a whole lot more households um, than, uh, than, than down here. I mean, this, this, is, this is fewer. This is capturing a lot more households. Uh, but you can also see that in the same income bracket, if you move from insecure to secure, the problem shrinks quite dramatically. So if we can move here from the, uh, the, the, the university researcher on a, a temporary job uh, to the tenured faculty uh, starting out their career, maybe at the same income level, but with some expectation of permanency, or maybe you're a, a Ford worker, or a General Motors worker, or a U.S. Steel worker, or a DeFasco worker, ArcelorMittal worker, uh, you're in this sort of middle income household, and you've got some security, there's a lot less anxiety. And it doesn't in interfere with the households. This really allowed us to get down into the household. So, I mean, what, what's the most dramatic policy implication of seeing this? Well, one is, look, we need to raise minimum wage. Right? Minimum wage is too low. People are living in poverty. But simply raising minimum wage, if people continue to operate under conditions of extreme in insecurity, is going to leave a lot of social issues. And in some ways, we might get more bang for our buck by figuring out how to give people more security. Right? We might be better off giving people security than just more money. Uh, and I think that's really a, a, the first really important policy implication. The second one is 
there, there's something going on in the middle class too. This is no longer uh, an issue of just the lower classes. There's something going on in the middle class here. Those people live in suburbia with mortgages and houses and kids with expectations. Uh, there's also something going on there. You know, and this is probably people who are in high tech, they're in the arts, they're in the media, they're including healthcare and education. Um, they're probably in this bin uh, and, 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 they, and they've got some problems. We also ask people, look at, to what extent are you delaying having children? Right now, I've already alluded to this, and I think here the, 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 the story is pretty clear. Again, not surprising. If you're in that under 50,000 group and insecure, you're saying, well, look, I'm just, I'm not, I, I need to think uh, out uh, having kids before I go and have them. Uh, if you move up to some more security, you may be in a relatively poor household, but you have some security, and this is less of an issue. You're less likely to delay. But what's really surprising, if I'm in that middle income, 50 to 100,000, and insecure, guess what? I'm almost as likely to delay as those people in the low income insecure. So insecurity itself, again, is having an independent effect uh, and, and, and a significant effect on the likelihood of having children. Uh, again, this was another one of the big surprises, so slide 39 in, in, in our study. Um, again, the, the, the thought was, the, nor the household norm was, one person has a permanent job, one person has an insecure job. And in most cases, the guy has the permanent job, the woman has the insecure job. And that was sort of the family norm of the 1970s. What this is suggesting is that we're actually seeing something quite different emerging in our society. So again, here, we're looking at the, the thousand people uh, in the most precarious jobs, the thousand people in the least precarious jobs. GM, Ford, fa tenured faculty up here, temp workers, uh, contract workers down here. And what we asked here is, when the person filled in the survey, was, whether it was a man or a woman who picked up the phone, they filled in the survey for us. So one person from each household filled in the survey. This is the results from men who filled in the survey. And so we asked them about their partner's employment. So down here, what we have is, this is men who are in insecure employment. We asked them, what about your partner's employment? And you can see almost a third of the men who are working through temp agencies on short-term contracts have partners who don't have any employment. And only about 40, just over 40% have partners in full-time employment. So of the men, I'm in a temporary job, uh, but only four out of 10 of, of, of partners like myself would be in some kind of a full-time job. Whereas if we're up here, the secure folks, right, only, just over 20% have no employment. Right, so, uh, my part, so I'm in a secure job, uh, and 80% and, and of, of my partners in my situation, they have some kind of, of, of employment. And you can see almost 60%, uh, over half, have full-time employment. And so what we're seeing is a clustering of, if you have secure employment, then your partner's more likely to have a permanent job or some kind of a job. If you have insecure employment, then it's less likely your partner has a job or has secure employment. And so what's going on here? Well, this is a question that we need now are going to explore more in a second round of surveys. But we think what's going on here is, look, I don't know my schedule. I don't know if I'm going to be having a job in, in, in two months. I don't know if I'm going to have to move. And therefore, my partner can't make a commitment to a kind of permanent ongoing job. So we can't commit, say, to expensive childcare Monday to Friday at a, whatever it is, a thousand dollars a kid or whatever, uh, because I don't know if I'm going to have my job. I can afford it this month. I may not have that job next month. So rather than that, one partner stays at home. Right. And while there, this is certainly the strongest for men about their partners, it's also true for women who filled in the survey about their partners. It's not quite as strong, but we're seeing the same kind of clustering. So if, if, if the woman is in part-time employment, temporary employment, their partner is less likely to have some kind of a full-time job. So that's a really important shift, I think, in the, in the nature of families. We're seeing a clustering. Full-time employment goes with full-time partners. Part-time employment goes with part-time part employed partners. Right? And that's just compounding the insecurity of some households uh, rather than others. So if you think of income being unfairly distributed in our society, well, security is being unfairly distributed in our society. Some households are getting more than their share, others less than their share. 
Okay, raising children. Again, you can, you can see now where, you know, where our story is going. People in this insecure employment, they have lower income, they have uh, less uh, stable income, uh, they, they can't plan, they don't know their schedule. Uh, obviously, this is going to have an impact uh, on, on kids. And, and we, we heard some, to be frank, pretty horrific stories of the, of the kind of, of, of stress this puts on, on children in households. Um, this is one of the questions we asked about the challenge of providing. Uh, providing for children. Uh, and this was uh, whether they can provide school supplies. And here there's a, there's, a, there's a pretty clear income gradient. So if we just look at the gold bars, uh, this is at least some of the time you can see the poorer you are, uh, the, the more likely it is that you cannot provide uh, for, uh, for, for, your, for your kids. But what's also quite clear in that gradient, as in each family income level, as you move from insecure to secure, the problem shrinks. Right, so households making less than 50,000 and insecure, one in three say, look, this is, this, is all, I, I, this is a problem, at least sometimes. Uh, if we move up here to secure and low income, it's only a quarter. Likewise, if you're in insecure middle income, look, it's a problem 15% of the time, but without changing the income level, if you simply move from insecure to secure, it's only a problem about 7% of the time. So again, this notion that, look, I don't know what my future income is going to be. Uh, maybe I better not spend on that kid's backpack, or maybe I better not send my kids to camp, uh, whatnot, because I can afford it today, but maybe I can't afford it tomorrow. So they were telling us, yeah, we kind of need to bank that money because we don't know if we're going to have this job in the future. So again, this has a direct impact from the employment relationship onto what kids can expect uh, in their lives. Uh, child care, I, again, I kind of alluded to this, but you can see this really quite dramatically. Uh, the challenges of, of finding child care if you're in insecure employment. And again, you see, not surprising, if you're insecure, low income, yeah, there's a big problem there. If your most of your work comes from a temp agency, I mean, how do you possibly commit to uh, child care, which it tends to be weekly and quite expensive? Uh, if you're in the secure low income, well, this is someone said, look, I have a job today. I expect to have that later on. You know, and, and I'm probably have a low enough income level, I can probably get maybe a subsidy. It's less of a problem for them. But if you move into this insecure middle income, it's as big a problem for them as it is for the, for the, for the insecure low income. So again, for the middle income, I don't know if I work weekends. I don't know if I, if I work 80 hours this week, none next week. Um, I, I have a real challenge organizing my child care. And that's going to have knock-on effects. Well, maybe I better not have kids. That's going to knock on effects on anxiety because my partner wants to have kids. And we can't because we've got all these, these, these crises in our household um, and, and such. And you know, no wonder uh, families are falling apart. OK, last one, and we're almost finished here. So the last one was around community. Uh, and again, this is what really got me started. And, and uh, with a lot of research, none of my pre-assumptions were, were validated by the data. So I mean, that's the problem with data. I think that's why the conservatives don't want as much. Uh, the picture is very different than what I expected. So here's what I expect. I thought, you're in precarious employment. Uh, your kid wants you to, to manage their ball team. I can't because I don't know my schedule. I don't know when the temp agency calls. I'm on these short-term contracts, et cetera. Uh, and it, it was the people in permanent jobs, you know, to be frank, people like my dad who could say, yeah, I can coach the ball team because I know I'm working eight till four. After four o'clock, um, I'll go out and co uh, coach your ball team. Look, at, that's not what we found at all. What we found was an infinitely more complex picture. So for, for some people, particularly it seems for women, they opted out of permanent full-time employment because they wanted to be more engaged in their community. They wanted to be engaged in their kids' schools. They wanted to be engaged in things that were going on in their neighborhoods, neighborhood associations, et cetera. And so they, they opted for being on a short-term contract, working part-time, working through temp agencies so they had more control over their, their time. You work through a temp agency and say, I'm not working from June until August. Right? So that was one pattern that we saw with someone. We saw that less often with men. And I, you know, I th now that I think about it, that's probably not new. That's probably been a reality for a long, long time that women have opted out because, you know, who knows, maybe they care more about their kids. Uh, but certainly they, they have done that for a long time, or men don't care about their kids. I guess that's the other side of the coin. But what we also found is that there were a lot of people who said, look, at, I would like to be more engaged with my kids' lives. I'd like to be more engaged in my community, but I can't because of the barriers of being in this kind of precarious employment. And here, rather than a chart, I'm just going to show some quotes. Um, 
So in, in part, this is something, look, I can't volunteer in my community because I'd probably have to take a bus to get to where I, I'm at. I don't have the money to do that. I don't know if I'm going to have the money. So I, 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 can't, I can't find the funds to volunteer because it's expensive to, to engage in volunteer activities. Um, the, the, this issue of you know, my schedule, they want me to commit uh, uh, so many hours a month, uh, but with my schedule, I just don't know if I can do that. I, 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 you know, I don't know if I can make a regular commitment to an organization, so I don't make any commitment. Uh, or the third kind of person says, look, it, I, don't have my, I, don't have, I can't give away my time for free. I'm, I'm out there beating the paths, finding more permanent employment. I'm waiting at the phone for the temp agency to call me. I can't just give away my time to the, these organizations. So for this group, they would like to be more engaged, but their precarious employment is stopping them from being engaged. Right? And I think that's something that's worth, worth, worth thinking about in terms of, of the long-term implications for, for our community. Okay, and last slide before we, 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 we tell you what the solution is here. The last thing we looked at was individual kind of community uh, in, engagement. You know, are people isolated because they're in this kind of precarious employment? Uh, and this is simply a question, do you have friends to do things with? Right? And again, this, is pretty this was pretty surprising. Uh, you know, very clearly you can see the, the lines are fatter down at the bottom at the beginning. So there's something about ha not having income which makes it more difficult to have friends. Uh, but again, and this may not be immediately obvious until I point it out, just look at the gold, oops, just look at the gold bars. So that's men. These are the pictures of men. And what you can see is that men in low income and insecure employment are the least likely to have friends. They, they have the most isolation. Uh, if you have low income secure job, you're a little bit better off. But look what happens to the men in middle income households in insecure employment. They're almost as likely to say, I don't have friends. And so, again, what's the story that's going on here? Is this men saying, look, I'm, I'm failing. I, I don't have that permanent job with benefits. Uh, I, I can't go out and say I, I can support my, my, my family. Or is this men saying, uh, look, I can't afford to go golfing anymore because, you know, it's too expensive given I may not have a job in a year. Uh, or or, I, or I, I don't have that, that new car and I, you know, show off to my other, other male friends. So this is, insecurity is, is clearly a big problem for, for men. So we see from, this is insecure, secure, low income. This is insecure, uh, secure, middle income. And in each case, insecurity seems to have a, a, a quite a dramatic impact on the likelihood of men having, having friends. For women, these are the maroon bars. Eh, it's not an issue, right? Very clearly, being low income, whether you're secure or insecure, has, has a negative implication of having friends. Here, there's a little bit of impact going from insecure to secure. It's not much. And the best off are those women in, in high income households. And there, for the most part, it doesn't matter whether you're secure or insecure. Right? And so again, there seems to be at, at a level uh, of, of individual isolation an impact of, of being in precarious employment. And again, the social agencies that I work with say, wow, that's what we're hearing. I mean, that's an issue, that there's a crisis out there for men, um, and, and they're floundering as a result of this new labor market. So what do we do? Right, and I'll finish up on, on this. Well, I'm an optimistic. I mean, I think this is a horrible situation that we're describing here. All kinds of negative implications for families, community, and health. Uh, but I'm actually quite optimistic. I think we need to understand we're at a tipping point uh, and, and, that, and that we need to, to make change. Uh, and I think the, the, the kind of changes that we think about come in two areas. One is, can we minimize the prevalence of precarious employment? Can we you can tell how many economists, incentivize employers to provide more permanent employment, to provide more secure employment. And I think that's one thing we can do. I'm not, I'm not optimistic that we can have big impacts on that, because I think this kind of uh, flexible employment is, is, is here with us for, for at least a while. But I think where we can make more progress is how can we mitigate its negative effects? So in, in the case of, of child care, not only do we need more child care and cheaper child care, we need more flexible child care. So we need child care who says, yep, today I need child care Tuesday and Wednesday. Next week I need it Friday and Saturday. Right? And I lived in France for a while. You can get that kind of child care in France. You get tickets, a book of 10 tickets, and you come on Monday morning and say, I, you know, I've got work. I'm going to drop my kids off for the day. You know, try doing that here in, in, in Canada. Pretty difficult. And so, so instead you rely on an informal arrangements, parents, uh, the neighbors, you know, who knows you know, what you're, you're relying on in order to, to take care of your kids. So uh, you can mitigate effects that way. What about pensions, right? What we know is people in precarious employment are not getting pensions from their employers anymore. Well, I think we need a different pension scheme. I think the idea is to increase the Canada pension plan is, is a brilliant solution um, uh, to that problem. Can we create new organizations? They may be unions, they may be something else 
have some kind of sectoral organizations that can provide the dental benefits, the health benefits, the drug benefits that are no longer being provided by employers. Can we provide different kinds of unemployment insurance, bridging schemes that allow uh, people to uh, overcome these periods of no employment? Uh, in the United States, they've, they've experimented a little bit with wage insurance. So unemployment insurance just gives you money if you don't have a job. Wage insurance says, I had a job that paid me 20 bucks an hour. My next job pays me $10 an hour. Wage insurance covers part of that difference for six months. Right? And so you don't, you don't bear the full cost of that. So you're always in employment because you can't afford not to be in employment, but you don't suffer quite the cost of, of, of not having a wage. So there's, there are things that we can do. Um, I think we just have to uh, put the uh, metal to the pedal or the pedal to the metal, whatever it is, uh, and, and get on with change. And so from the perspective of ourselves the United Way, we're now engaged in basically a two-year uh, conversation, and we're looking at how can we ensure jobs are our pathway to employment security. So that doesn't mean one employer full-time forever. Uh, that can mean a series of employers, but some sense that you'll always have an employer. And if you don't have one for a short period of time, you'll get some bridging to take care of that, either retraining or et cetera. Uh, supporting human capital development. We, we assign to employers the, the responsibility of, of training up workers once they finish their formal education, whether it was high school or university. So the old fantasy, uh, someone starts in the mail room, sorting the mail, and boom, after 20 years, they're the, they're the CEO because they accumulate knowledge and whatnot of what's going on. Well, you know, back 30 or 40 years ago, that may have worked because the mail room boy off, and sometimes it would be a woman, uh, was probably a permanent employee. And then there was a commitment to them. They were always there. Today, probably the mailroom person is a temp worker. And the employer has no, no expectation that person is going to be there in six months. So why give them any training? Why give them any uh, access to, to, to money to, to move forward? And so I think there's that whole, that, that whole issue of training is, 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 is being uh, uh, avoided. And I think that's the flip side of the debate we see every day in the paper, employers complaining. We can't find workers with the, with the right kind of skills. And I think that's because they've abrogated their responsibility to do this. So again, how do, how do we do this? Do we make this more of a public responsibility? I think the, the last area is enhancing social and community supports. I mean, it's criminal. I think that families can't uh, provide for the kids' basic school needs, you know, pencils and, and papers. Um, that, they, that, that, you know, if the kid wants to do some after-school activities, either play hockey or soccer or maybe go to camp, they, they can't do that. Uh, I think we just have to find a more equitable way uh, of allocating those things. And why am I optimistic? I'm optimistic because today, per person, we're richer than we were in 2008. And in 2008, we were richer per person than we were in 1998. And in 1998, we were richer per person than we were in 1988. And in 1988, we were richer per person than we were in 1978. Right? That's the reality of our economy, and yet so many of us feel worse off. And so something has gone seriously wrong in our labor market. The benefits of all that growth have not gone to the majority of us. But surely if in 78 we could afford a, a, a society which was more stable and, 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 and fair and nurturing of families and communities, there's absolutely no reason why, why we can't afford that in 2013. We just need to change our policy perspective where we're going. That's it.